Hello and welcome to another Maine Historical Society program. I'm Kathleen Newman. It's July 26, 2022, and this is From Head to Heel, uh, Dressing Maine in the Long 18th Century with Dr. Kimberly Alexander. Dr. Alexander is on the faculty of the History Department at the University of New Hampshire, where she is the Director of the Museum Studies uh, Program and Lecturer. Uh, she's held uh, curatorial positions at many New England new museums, uh, including MIT, Peabody Essex, and Strawberry Bank. She's the author of two uh, beautiful and really uh, wonderful books, Treasures of Foot Shoe Stories from the Georgian Era, uh, which features a pair of shoes that's actually featured right now in our exhibit, uh, Northern Threads. And uh, fashioning her latest book published uh, last year, Fashioning New England, the New England Family, uh, was published by the Massachusetts Historical Society. She was the guest curator of the exhibit, Fashioning the New England Family. Um, and that book is available through uh, our museum store at Maine Historical Society. And this talk tonight is uh, one of our series for our exhibit, Northern Threads. And I just wanna remind everyone that this Saturday, July 30th, is the last day to see part one of this exhibition. Uh, well, the exhibition is gonna close July 31st through August 11th to allow time to transition the exhibit to part two, which will feature pieces from about 1890 to 1980. So if you haven't had a chance to see part one uh, yet, or if you wanna see it one more time uh, before those collections, get put away. Uh, come on down to MHS before the end of this week. Otherwise, hope we'll see you after on or after August 12th. So Dr. Alexander, uh, thanks so much for being here with us this evening. Thank you. And thank you, everybody from the staff at the Maine Historical for making me feel so incredibly welcome. Um, I had a chance to spend a long visit at the exhibition, the first part of Northern Threads. And all I can say is if you haven't been yet, um, run, don't walk. Uh, it really is a fabulous, fabulous uh, installation with um, a lot of exciting new uh, information and a chance to really um, make your own discoveries, which is what I always love about being part of a discussion about fashion. So thank you all for having me. Um, and do get to see the exhibit. I'll be going back up for the second half. Also, Kathleen, just so you know. So Excellent. hopefully I'll get to see everybody again. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Mm -hmm. We're kind of doing this old school tonight, everybody. So <laughs> um, I'm doing something a little different than, uh, than I normally uh, do when I'm giving a lecture. I'm making this more of a a personal reflection um, on marking time with five stops along uh, sort of the history of Maine textiles and fashion. Um, in large part because, well, to be quite honest, there's such a wonderful sweep of material and how do you really break up uh, all these decades and centuries? Um, and so I'm also gonna be honest with you, although this is the long 18th century, I find that many of the things that we're looking at today and that are in the exhibit or in the way that we uh, study textiles and, um, and fashion coexist over much long periods of time. They may change, fall in and out of fashion, but um, I'm going to be using some materials that actually we first see discussed in the um, uh, 17th century uh, and are still reappearing in the um, in the early 19th century. So this is a personal reflection, and I'm going to focus on five objects. Oh, next slide, please. Um, I have to be. This is another thing I don't usually do, which is a, in terms of personal reflection, um, which is to talk a little bit about my own personal connection with Maine and. Um, Years ago as a child, I'm actually showing a rather uh, old and embarrassing photo um, of myself, but uh, 
uh, we used to summer in Maine uh, in the Sebago Lakes region, my family and I, and it left such a strong impression that when I decided to apply for colleges, I looked at um, Bates, Bowdoin, and Colby. Now, you might not think that was unusual, except I'm from Maryland, and so that was kind of a big, a big step um, uh, for everybody, including my family, and for me when I realized how cold Maine really was in the winters. Um, and I ultimately spent my college career in Waterville. Um, since moving to New Hampshire, uh, I do return to Maine as often as possible. I'd love to visit the Saco Museum and see my friend uh, Tara Vos Raceless, the Maine State Museum, visit with Lori Labar. The Brick Store Museum uh, has several of my students working there, South Berwick Historical Society, Old York Historical, and of course the Maine Historical Society. So Maine is um, a place that is uh, near and dear to my heart. And I was reminded of that when I got to spend the day in, uh, in uh, Portland for the exhibition. Next slide, please. So the five objects that I'm going to focus on today um, are gonna be the fabric of a, um, of a, a small purse made of porcupine quills which is in the collection of the Maine Historical Society. I'm going to look at um, Governor of Massachusetts, Governor John Leverett's buff coat will be my second object. My third uh, object will be beaver and beaver felted hats um, in general, but specifically those by Byron Greeno of Portland. My fourth object will be looking at the expensive imported uh, probably English brocaded silks, of which you'll see several stunning examples in the gallery. But I'll be focusing in particular on a pair of shoes, Deborah Thaxter's wedding shoes um, as my fourth object. And my fifth object will be looking at examples of uh, developing mechanization and the cotton uh, textile industry throughout New England, but I'll be looking particularly at a few sites um, in, in Maine. So as I say, a number of these ideas span several centuries and generations. Um, so, uh, but I think you'll be able to see where my thought process is. So I'm, I'm starting here with the John Speed view of, of uh, New England, which I'm sure many of you have seen. Um, but to get across the idea of the abundance of land, um, natural resources, inland waterways, the sea, uh, brooks, streams, um, animals and plants, the flora and fauna. Um, and these provided generations of the Abenaki and Wabanaki with what they needed. The people of the Dawnlands rhythms, however, would be disrupted um, first with the transient Anglo-European uh, fishing colonies that would start uh, uh, fishing for cod, and later by those who became more permanent seeking furs and timbers. Next slide, please. Um, one of the first white naturalists to publish about Maine's distinct character was the Englishman John Jocelyn. Um, and he traveled from London to Scarborough, Maine, in, and wrote a book in 1672. He actually wrote uh, a second book too on two, his two different journeys called New England Rarities Discovered. And you can buy a very inexpensive uh, Bedford or Applewood Press version of Jocelyn's accounts. And it's really quite interesting um, because he looked at not only the plants um, and animals that he came across, but also he included a number of uh, indigenous me medical um, medicinal treatments throughout his treatise. Um, I love the image on the top, which uh, was uh, a, a, of a sunflower, or as he called it, the marigold of America. May I have the next slide, please? So we can roughly see that these as far as textiles and fibers are concerned, that we're looking at hides, so, uh, so uh, deer skin, uh, moose, uh, elk, and so on, pelts and furs, whether they're beaver, uh, ermine, uh, and so on and so on, um, and then fibers, both imported and then manufactured um, here in uh, here in Maine. Um, the, it's important to remember that things like the brocaded silks that we talk about and the embroideries 
um, were not being completed in the 17th and, and even through much of the, uh, up to about the middle of the 18th century in, um, in the American colonies. Next slide, please. So here is our friend, uh, the porcupine. And I'd like to, um, to read to you uh, directly from Jocelyn's um, New England Rarities, because one of the projects I'm sort of looking at now is the fibers uh, that he picks up on and talks about how they're used in, um, in the uh, work of indigenous people. He writes about the porcupine and I quote, the porcupine in some parts of the country eastward towards the French are as big as an ordinary mongrel cur. A very angry creature it is and dangerous shooting a whole tower of quills. The Indians make use of their quills which are hardly a handful long to adorn the edges of their birchen dyes and weave, dyeing some of them red, others yellow and blue, curious bags or pouches in works like turkey work. May I have the next slide, please? And I think this is an excellent example um, of uh, the type of work that, although he's writing a hundred years before uh, Male Agat creates this, uh, this small um, purse out of porcupine quills and hemp, um, it's still gonna be in the same sort of style that someone like Jocelyn is, is, uh, is connecting with, right? And so um, uh, Male Agat, uh, created this probably around the 1770s or 80s. Um, she was also known as a, a doctor and traveled uh, widely throughout, throughout the region. Um, and this is an absolute treasure that has actually come down uh, through, uh, through family uh, ties, actually through um, Illy Twitchell of Bethel's family, apparently when he was asked to put a metal clasp or when he put a metal clasp on this particular piece. I do wanna say this is not in the, um, in the current exhibition, but um, there are, but I do want you to be aware of the connection between uh, how we, uh, an Englishman, somebody like Jocelyn uh, describes pieces that we actually have created by um, indigenous hands, not many, but I think this is a really uh, a, a beautiful example to, to talk about. For those of you who are interested, you may have seen uh, years ago at the Maine State Museum, um, Uncommon Threads, uh, which was uh, still has a catalog, um, I think available that you may wanna take a look at if you're interested in looking at the er early fiber work of, um, of the Northern indigenous peoples. Next slide, please. And here is um, a detail, a close-up of the same piece. Um, I think you can agree that in addition to her artistry, well, I think it's important to say the artistry of not only um, somebody like Molly Agat, but also uh, embroider embroiderers, seamstresses, makers the world over, that this is a form of artistry. And it's in the last really 20, 30 years that, um, that more mainstream academics have started to accept that this uh, so-called, in used to be called women's work, holds an important place in understanding our country's development um, through all different sections of culture, uh, race, ethnicity, and society. Um, may I have the next slide, please? Now, this is my second object um, in my highly personal and um, subjective tour. Uh, this is a what's known as a buff coat, and I've sort of titled this suck section something to think about for you all. Buff coats, buckskin breeches, and deerskin moccasins. Um, these are all items that you see showing up in probate inventories, in account books, in day books of, of country merchants, uh, as well as urban merchants. Uh, next slide, please. 
This buff coat is in the collection of the Massachusetts Historical Society, um, and it is featured in our Fashion in the New England Family exhibition. And I have to say, I was incredibly fortunate to be able to work with this garment um, for the exhibition Fashioning the New England Family at MHS a few years ago. Um, the, uh, the illustration you see actually on the far, uh, the far right is it's still in its box. Um, it was on deposit, it was actually donated to MHS in 1803 by an actual descendant also named John Leverett because that's what people do in New England, right? Um, everyone has the same, same names um, uh, at Massachusetts Historical Society. So it's been in their collection since 1803, which is really quite something to think about. Um, and for the exhibition, um, uh, Astrida Schaefer uh, did the uh, mannequins for our exhibitions. And uh, you can see on the left, the actual um, buff coat uh, as staged for, um, for the exhibition. And in the middle is a uh, black and white portrait. The color portrait exists at the uh, Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Mass, um, of Leverett wearing this very same coat. How do we know that? Well, when we examine the openings here, you can see that they that there were clasps that have been removed that match these imprints exactly. These would have been silver clasps. Obviously somebody had a better use for them at some point. Um, and so what we decided to do here was just to lace this up and you can still see the clasps. The buff coat was, um, I think we wanna look at this as sort of at the other end of the spectrum. Um, we don't know where the, the ox hide came from for the coat, but what we do know is that it was purchased in England and that the tanning of the hides um, was considered to be uh, a very, very good, high quality, obviously in England. Um, and really at that time, the colonies were not set up for that level, I think, of tanning. Um, and then the sewing was also completed in England. So Leverett purchases his coat he actually um, uh, wore it during several different types of military service. This is an interesting um, uh, garment that would have been used by somebody who was involved with uh, horseback, with cavalry, so that if uh, you were to see the back, you would see that it actually would uh, fly up so you could have ease of riding. It's actually 14 separate pieces stitched together. And if you take a look closely at the details, you can see that this is an incredibly thick, high. Um, it was to be worn, sometimes they were partly worn with armor or not, but it became a principal uh, mode of protection for cavalry, cavalry men and for foot soldiers, soldiers eventually. It was not inexpensive uh, to be able to purchase something like this. And here you can see um, the uh, slashing, the cutouts, which were a popular stylistic device. So you could pull through a linen or a silk shirt. And here in the portrait, you see uh, Leverett with his gloves and here a collar, this crest here behind him, a belt, wide belt of which one of the belt loops is still in existence on the back of this coat, which dates, as I said, to about the 1640s. Um, coats like this can be found in collections worldwide. Um, and were continued to be used uh, in uh, uh, outlying areas uh, into well into the 18th century. Um, Leverett was born in uh, Boston, England in 1616, and he immigrated to Massachusetts Bay with his parents in 1633, um, who had followed Reverend Cotton. So he became a merchant, but he devoted much of his time to, uh, to military affairs and we know through um, family sources that uh, he engaged in battle um, with the French uh, in Northern New England and in Canada, uh, and also at least one account of likely uh, uh, active combat with indigenous uh, tribes. So, so here you have uh, another object displaying the colonization and changes from where uh, from the pastoral ideal in which we had 
had started. Um, may I have the next slide, please? Now, run, running uh, sort of parallel, I think, with the work that we just saw, both the indigenous uh, people's use of fibers like porcupine quills um, and the fashions of Anglo-Europeans such as leveret, uh, we see um, other European fashion trends focus on, for example, I'm in this case, I'm choosing the beaver. Uh, this fierce, angry European beaver, um, who Jocelyn also writes about as being an incredibly valuable, not only for his pelt, but also for his glands, which could be used to make medicine, um, and his tail for something else. Basically, you could use every bit of the beaver. Um, and one of the things that we see again in Speed's map here, beaver here, always symbolized with cutting down the trees, and here in New Scotland. Um, and at this time, the beaver fur was became very popular in the 1550s, beaver pelts for hats. And if any of you are interested in doing some more sort of partially recreational reading, I might recommend uh, a book called Vermeer's Hat, which traces these uh, beaver pelts back to Europe and how they were used um, in trend-setting ways. Um, so starting about 1550, we know that beaver was popular in, in Europe for hats. Um, we think of it as an accessory today, but hats were a mandatory part of everyday dress for both sexes. Um, and beaver hats were the most prized. Uh, you find them in 16th century English royalty. You'll find the conically shaped, tall, uh, somewhat awkward looking hats of 17th century pilgrims. And then ultimately the tricorn hats of American patriots in the 18th century. Um, religiously, the idea of covering one's head was uh, paying respect to the divine, deference to God. But I think in this case, more importantly, it's the social trend. Um, it's a practice that became increasingly widespread throughout the 17th century. Now, the cost of a beaver hat, uh, and may I have the next slide, please? Um, the cost of a beaver hat uh, severely restricted accessibility to a general consumer market. These tended to be uh, hats of the elite. And we even find that in the late 18th and 19th century that hats came in very uh, uh, strong cases that were perfectly molded to the shape of the hat so it wouldn't be damaged. Um, a number of the services that were provided by hatters include um, things like reblocking hats and so on and so on. Um, now, beaver hats would start to come down in price um, after the influx of North American beaver pelts in the later part of the 17th century and into the 18th century. This coincided with changes in um, what was known as uh, instead of using full beaver pelts, but using beaver felt, um, which I think is a, a, a wonderful sort of marketing device because what uh, felting meant that you were mixing in um, other types of fur, like rabbit fur, um, uh, in with the, the, the more expensive product to produce a hat that looked the same, but was not as expensive to produce. Um, but even, Taking into account the lowering of price between, let's say, 1600 and 1700, it prevented a majority of people from being able to purchase such a thing, favoring instead knit hats and so on. But despite this, uh, we find by 1793, um, in an account book that I'm working with in, uh, in northern New Hampshire, we find that a cost of a beaver felted hat of the latest style um, in 1793 being sold in the North Country of, uh, in New Hampshire um, was similar cost to purchasing a pair of shoes, somewhere between um, six to 12 shillings. So it's starting to become something that is, that is accessible. And for example, I find young men going who are about to get married who are making this kind of a purchase. Um, but as we start moving into the 19th century, uh, beaver populations in North America will, of course, begin to 
constrict also from over over hunting. So a lot of what we're looking at here too, we start with this territory, this uh, area, this region that's very rich in resources. Um, and whether it's overfishing or overhunting, uh, meeting a consumer demand, um, we're going to start certainly start start to see a a uh, limitation of what is available, which in turn will get eventually raise the price, or consumers will go to something different. May I have the next slide, please? Um, beaver and beaver felt hats are well discussed in the Northern Threads exhibit. And uh, so I, again, I, I urge you to, to take it in if you can. One of um, the uh, hatters uh, out of Portland, Maine, Byron Goodno, uh, Greeno, sorry, excuse me, um, was a name I was familiar with because years ago when I was at Historic Deerfield, I was able to see the tall hat, which you see here in front of you. This is a bleached beaver fur tall hat. Um, as I mentioned, it's a historic deer field. And um, it, ha it has Greeno's label inside. Uh, he was um, uh, quite the entrepreneur. He started off with um, learning his trade probably in Haverhill, Massachusetts. And then he struck out on his own ending up in Portland, Maine in 1821. Um, this is, as I mentioned, from historic Deerfield and it immediately caught my eye because of the bleached beaver fur, which was very popular in the 1820s to about 1835. This hat was probably, well, was completed after Reno's arrival in Portland. And fortunately he labeled his hats. Um, his business grew rapidly to include not only hats, but also boots and shoes. And he eventually was able to erect his own building, the Greeno building, Flatiron building, um, at the head of Free Street in Portland. Uh, next slide, please. Now, here I'm moving away from the idea of, of raw materials that were available uh, and looking at the um, expensive imported textiles like woven silk brocades. Uh, in this case, I'm most likely going to look at, well, in this case, I'm looking at English, what are most likely English brocaded silks. Um, this is one of the uh, really stunners in, from my perspective, um, in the exhibition. The, uh, the woven uh, uh, silk probably dates to about the 1740s, but the dress has a, a, a a complex family provenance and history, but it's been suggested that it was updated to a 1760 to 1775 style. Um, and then it was updated again, uh, updated or recreated for an 1825 ball in Portland, but it was to reflect the earlier style. So this is a little comp complicated uh, for um, a, uh, a ball in Portland, which was in honor of the Marquis de Lafayette. Um, and it may have been likely that it was reconstructed yet again for fancy dress or for the colonial revival movement. Now, as complicated as that history might be, it does tell us something very important about this sort of fabric, um, that you would continue to remake uh, a fabric from the 1740s um, well into the 19th century, for those of us who look at fashion all the time, don't find this to be anything particularly unusual um, because the value that the textiles held, uh, they held over decades. Um, so there, the value can be twofold. It can be to the family who sets aside this fancy garment um, and also uh, to those who, who see it as a way of continuing uh, family stories by perhaps making, cutting the dress into a child's dress, uh, or as I'll talk about shortly, into a pair of shoes. Um, there is this, I think, something that appeals to us today too, with this idea of um, uh, repurposing, of thrifting, of using vintage. Um, uh, they were all over this long before, uh, long before we were, but I think we can learn a lot in terms of how, in terms of how we move, uh, move forward. May I have the next slide, please? 
Uh, here, a gentleman's waistcoat. I'm actually, in the interest of time, going to pass by this, but uh, the back of this is a plain linen, and the front, which would have been the only part that was seen, was uh, a silk, uh, embroidered silk. Um, and in many of the examples of men's waistcoats that I've had the good fortune to work with, for example, at the Massachusetts Historical Society, um, you see uh, as somebody grows, uh, the word I like to use is as we get older, we often become girthier. Um, we'll add uh, seams, darts, extend the fabric. As long as the front still looks the same, um, why not take some liberties with what's happening with your behind on the vest because you'll be wearing your uh, uh, you'd be wearing your jacket over it. Um, and in this particular example that's on view, you can see some of the lines that were drawn out for the embroiderer to follow. These vests came in pieces and then were assembled, generally assembled um, when they arrived for for the client. Next slide, please. Now this is a pair of shoes that um, I've been, I wrote, first wrote about, I think, I don't know, eight or maybe, could it be as long as 10 years ago now? Probably not that long, but Deborah Thaxter's wedding shoes do appear in my book, Treasures of Foot, um, in part because the story, I think, it, it encapsulates what, everything that I was just talking about. Um, so the textiles in the 17th and 18th century held their value long after a given style had ceased to be popular. And for those of you who do probate inventory and research, you know that very often there's a column for textiles uh, where they are placed in with monetary, as monetary, having monetary value because they could be sold on the open market. Um, and, uh, uh, and so this idea of maintaining these things, maybe even for a rainy day, as has been suggested by historian John Stiles, um, that you might have scraps of gold lace or uh, embroidery or silk brocades that even if it was a small piece that you could set aside, knowing that it had some cash value to someone at some time, even in harder, harder days. So the... Um, so the idea that textiles hold their value long after a given style is popular, I think is important. And we find these examples of brocades and damasks and less so woolens because they are more susceptible to vermin um, and, and also just everyday use, but certainly brocades and damasks cut down and made into smaller items. A child's dress made from a mother's gown, a woman's bodice or jumps fashioned from a man's coat, or an earlier dress, a quilted petticoat transformed to or from a bedspread, and textiles to shoes, needle cases, and any number of smaller items. In this context then, the use of a silk brocade from a 1739 wedding dress, Deborah Thaxter's mother's wedding dress from 1739, were refashioned uh, into her wedding shoes, which you see here on the screen, in 1773, you find that to be entirely consistent. Further, weddings, as we know, or at least used to be frequently conservative events, um, naturally imbued with traditions that were shared across generations. I mean, we still do something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue, right? Um, when the 21-year-old bride, Deborah Thaxter, married Captain James Todd in 1773, her mother had died a few years earlier in 1769. Um, and the main historical has got a, if you have not used their main memory net, the main memory network, you can uh, get a number of uh, uh, more details about these particular shoes. But what I'm interested in here is the reuse. So the mo her mother died before she was married. And I think you could look at it um, that the survival of the shoes using this repurposed silk most likely held a personal significance and meanings that may be outside the current family record. Um, in a way, you see that the mother's uh, brocade, which features these rosy peach colored floral motif at the toes, um, but the form of the shoe itself is a later 18th century style, if you take a look at that, that narrower heel and pointed toe. 
But the decision to employ this older textile was one made by the bride, no doubt. And she would be literally and figuratively carrying her mother with her, walking with her mother, um, gown pieces on her feet, in her shoes, into her new life. Um, which I think is one of those just amazing stories that textiles can tell and that make um, people uh, come alive to us and not always having to be those who are the upper echelons um, or the political uh, leaders. Uh, the early years of Deborah's married life, I should add, were punctuated by considerable uncertainty. Her husband was actually captured by the British um, shortly after their marriage. And while their first child was born in, a year after their marriage, their next child was not born until 1788. He was held a prisoner for nearly nine years. Um, but when he was released in 1784, what did he do? He remained a sea captain. Uh, the youngest son of the couple um, actually moved and spent time in Portland, probably bringing these shoes with him. Next slide, please. And the next. I wanted to say just a, a quick word about the importance of portraits in, captur in capturing uh, fashion and visual culture. And here I'm showing you in the center is a fabulous portrait from the Sacco Museum. And I wanna give a shout out uh, to uh, director Tara uh, Vos Raceless for, um, for just confirming some details about the portrait for me for this talk. Uh, but I've always been captivated by this portrait of Eunice Cuts Nye, um, painted by John Brewster, and as I mentioned, it's in the Sacco Museum. Um, and the painting was probably about 17, uh, sorry, about 1800. She married uh, Nye in 1803. And the dress that I'm showing you on either side is from the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and is dated 1785 to 90. And I think you can see right away the similarity. Um, Eunice would have been uh, in her, her late teens when she sat for this. Um, but right away you get a sense of a wider world don't you um when you take a look at at portraiture and how textiles are painted from the uh dr drama of the stripes and the obviously complicated uh workmanship that that would have or uh dressmaking that that would have uh entailed to that wonderful little bit of 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 lace uh or fichu around her her neck um and her hair uh, perfectly styled for her portrait. Next slide, please. And here, um, this uh, I mentioned the um, Cuts portrait by Brewster, and I'd like to just sort of, again, think about the visual culture of fashion um, through portraiture. Here is a portrait of Anne uh, Merrill Staples, circa 1835. It's attributed to the painter William Mather Matthew Pryor. Uh, and is an oil on canvas. Um, and I think that when you have this chance to look at, at portraiture um, and the garments these uh, women, uh, young women are painted in, it opens an entirely different sort of view corridor to, um, to our study of fashion history and adds another level of, of depth to, um, to our research resources. Next slide, please. So cotton and wool textile manufacturing. Um, I'm afraid this part of the talk will necessarily be a bit abbreviated and I won't uh, today be dealing with, um, with wool manufacture at all. I'm really sticking with, with cotton. I, as I said, I had to try and limit myself to objects, but um, there are certainly uh, many fabulous um, resources to look at the rise of of wool manufacturing um, as well as cotton uh, throughout New England. Next slide, please. So for my, my fifth object, 
I'm sort of just sort of generally looking at the the idea of the uh, cotton and textile manufacture. Um, it could be anywhere in New England. Obviously, in this case, I'm looking at Maine. Maine has a particularly early, early uh, uh, um, cotton manufacturing, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But I wanted to show you on the far left um, the child's dress, which is in the exhibition. Uh, it's a rare 18th century cotton survivor. It's a small child's dress that belonged to Olive Gray, who was born in 1779. So this is a cotton garment. Um, it has a square neck, pin tucked bodice, little frill sleeves, and it, the cotton it's made of apparently is very coarse. Um, the fabric was block printed with a red matter and a blue indigo floral pattern. Um, and it says that it was worn in North Yarmouth, Maine. So this is sort of, as you're getting, this is pre the major sort of textile first, because of course it's Eli Whitney and his cotton gin that tr transforms the cotton industry. Um, Whitney, as we know, never made a cent from his cotton gin, um, but he played through his invention a great part in creating the industrial North and also as as part of that, keeping um, the plantation south and the system of, of enslavement and forced labor on southern plantations. He made the production of co cotton more profitable, and he increased, through that, increased the concentrations of slaves who were uh, needed in cotton producing deep south. Now, this invention of Whitney's really gave a new lease on life to what many had thought would be uh, the dying out, the fading away of, of enslavement. Um, while some thought it would simply die out, the combination of Whitney's cotton gin um, and later trade tariffs, such as the tariff of 1816, the Southern economy became um, as it had been in the past reliant almost entirely on single crop productions. Earlier on, it was tobacco and rice and then cotton and so on. Um, slavery became even more entrenched. Now, this is, of course, an oversimplification, um, but I think it's important to mention that all of New England manufa cotton manufacturing is tied to and complicit with um, the enslaved. Uh, the image uh, in the center of the screen, the sort of sepia tone, is um, a, a photograph, so it's not the original building, of the uh, Brunswick Cotton Manufacturing Company, which first opened in 1809. So this is um, just, uh, just a, about a decade after cotton, Whit Whitney's cotton gin. Um, they processed cotton and spun yarn, and they used a reliable water source. So again, we're back to the idea of natural resources, that you could dam a brook, you could dam a stream, you could have all sorts of incredible power working these various mills um, through these the water as a natural resource. And then human uh, hands to dam, to provide sluice gates, to then operate the machinery. But it all starts with having the resources. So uh, in 1812, um, uh, Brunswick was purchased by the main cotton and woolen manufacturing and it then expanded. By the mid 19th century, it was actually uh, purchased by the Cabots. And the Cabots and the Lowell's um, were uh, well aware of the, uh, the reliance on Southern, Southern cotton. Um, another early mill uh, was uh, the Sacco Manufacturing Company, which I'm showing you on the far screen, which was built in 1825. And it's important again to remember that um, at a place, at any one of these factories, they needed the raw supply of cotton uh, in order from coming up from the South in order to produce these, um, these goods. By the mid 1820s, um, fashion had also shifted. And so uh, we're starting to see uh, more focus on these uh, 
the empire style gowns. If you all think Jane Austen, many of them were muslin, but we have a lot of cotton being produced here. Um, and the uh, dress here, and actually there's several, I should say, in the exhibition that are made um, of cotton. May I have the next slide, please? Okay, so I want to sort of return to where we started with this glorious pair of moccasins. Um, these are deerskin moccasins that are a tribute to a Penobscot nation artist, and they greet you when you walk in the exhibit. Um, my photos don't do them justice. I think, uh, if, again, if you have a chance to go and see them up close, they're dated to 1832. And they're interesting because they both feature uh, natural resources, but also um, more uh, consumer items in terms of the availability of the, the, uh, the beads. So here you have 1832 moccasins that have access to manufactured materials like woven cloth and glass beads, which save time from processing all the skins and stones which would have been done in traditional adornment. The introduction of the silk ribbons um, and, sta and standard sized glass beads led to flourishing um, innovations though in Wabanaki adornment. There's a, a wonderful statement that accompanies um, uh, these uh, moccasins. And so again, I encourage you to, to visit the exhibit and to read that. But one of the things that I want to mention um, that I found in my own research that is, uh, I hope to write about more extensively is in the account books of Northern shoemakers. Um, we find, I've found many references to what were called magazines with M-O-G-G, -G, various different sorts of phonetic spellings that were being supplied by New England shoemakers to their clients. Um, I don't know because they're not described, just moccasins or leather moccasins, but here you have um, Anglo-European uh, culture uh, appropriating this term and this type of footwear, which I think is fascinating. So you'll have to bear with me. I'm still working on that. Um, who knows, that'll probably be another 10 years. But anyway, um, I think it's something about the uh, the process of appropriation, acculturation in ways that we don't always expect. Um, snowshoes is another area uh, which I'm looking at and, and working on. Um, so, so now we've returned to the idea of the skins and the felts and, uh, and indigenous uh, creators. And may I have uh, my next slide, please? Now, see, I did a little sneaky thing here. You may have noticed I already did my five objects, which ended with the cotton mills, but then I decided to do the deerskin moccasins as a conclusion, and I'm squeezing in this pair of uh, stunning uh, brocaded silk 1740s London made shoes as my epilogue. So sorry, that's that's my uh, that's what I did. Um, these shoes are now in the collection of Colonial Williamsburg. And they were found in the attic in either Kittery or Elliott, Maine. Um, just sort of completely forgotten about, like the wearer had never worn them, um, long ago forgotten by their original purchaser. Uh, there's a label in the shoe, one of the shoes that uh, lists the maker, right out in Davis, who I write about extensively in my book. This discovery of this pair of shoes was one of those wonderful aha moments for me. Um, and they had their shoemaking uh, uh, shop uh, manufacturing near Aldgate in London. And one of the things that this tells us, actually these shoes tell us many, many things. We may not know who wore them, but we know who made them. We know where they were found and we know where they are now. So what can this say? Well, first of all, it says a lot about the way we can still find things that we don't expect to find. Um, one of the things that I always talk to my students about in class is, you know, if you think history is static, wait a minute, 
because it's not. Uh, with new technologies, with new discoveries, with new interpretations, with new readings, um, every day is a new day for history. And, uh, and that's sort of, I think, a pair of shoes like this um, can reveal a number of interesting layers uh, about how we save things, how we collect things, um, how we preserve things, and also the stories that they can tell us. To me, when I first saw these shoes, I was just stunned by their absolute dazzling beauty, this imperial yellow gold color and the beautiful purples and the toes are pattern matched. In other words, they would look the same looking on which expensive shoes did and lesser expensive shoes did not because it meant you had to use more fabric. So this is one of the things that uh, like a Louis Vuitton bag versus a knockoff, right? These would be the real McCoy because they were expensive to have this pattern cut and the heels would match and the toes would match, right? Um, so we learn about uh, buying patterns. So here you are in Elliot or Kittery, 1740s, and people might think of this as a frontier, um, right? But here you have this incredibly stylish pair of uh, impressive shoes. So that immediately changes our, shifts our focus, right, on, on what was happening in the North Country and in Maine and in Canada. Um, we know that during the revolution, of course, when a number of luxury goods came down from Canada, from loyalists to loyalists and so on, but this is even before that. So it gives us a reason to think about or to re-examine our, uh, perhaps our thought process. Um, and this idea of the stories that they have to tell, who knows what we may find out in the future um, about these shoes that we did not know before. Um, I think it's fair to say at this point that I, I have taken you from head to heel um, and uh, probably many other places. Um, we didn't talk about undergarments. That would be an entirely another lecture. Um, but may I have the last slide, please? I think I have one more. Yes. So I'm going to close out my personal reflection, as I say, on my five sort of items. And I'm going to ask you, what would your choices be if you were um, trying to give your talk uh, on uh, main textiles and fashion? Thank you all very much. Thank you, uh, Kimberly. That was that was really great. Um, we're already getting uh, some questions from the audience. Um, so speci about specifically some of the pieces that you mentioned. So that white beaver hat, which I've, I've never seen anything quite like that before. Um, when and with what would a, a gentleman wear a hat like that? Yes, that would be uh, your most stylish event. It was a tall hat. So um, right away, it would identify you as somebody of a certain socioeconomic strata. Um, the, the bleached beaver felt was popular um, for real, fairly limited time, but I will tell you that Historic Deerfield also has, not by, not by Greeno, I don't believe, but has a woman's bleached beaver fur riding hat. Wow. Yeah, and so it's shorter. It doesn't have, it's not a tall, tall hat, but it is an amazing piece with embroidery on the front. So, so you're looking at people who have um, wherewithal, I think um, to say it. And there's even the simple touch, like the grow grain ribbon around it. Mm -hmm. You know, this is like that elegant, mm -hmm. refined. Additionally, um, the brocade dress, how many pieces does it have now? Um, and Kimberly, if you don't know the answer to this question, um, Jamie Rice, our deputy director, uh, who curated the exhibit, I think she's in the audience tonight, so she may she oh, maybe can tell us too. <laughs> well, and I have to say, it's been so much fun working with Jamie. We did a, a radio uh, program. Um, That's right. Last week, and uh, and so yes, so Jamie, I did not touch anything when I was in the gallery. Of course, I know better. So I have, and so I have absolutely no idea how many pieces are actually in that gown, and if there are any extras, uh, because often they may they're extra pieces that came along with these um, garments. 
My guess is two or three pieces, but again, I'm going to leave, I'll leave that to Jamie to comment on, on an official answer. Um, how about uh, the shoes that you mentioned? So those wedding shoes, um, were they sewn by hand or was a sewing machine involved in any way? Those were sewn by hand. We had, um, it's, it's kind of easy to remember that you don't have um, really access to uh, general major sewing um, until the 19th century. 1830s, you're starting to see some of it, but really it's 1850s. Just like another thing when you're um, thinking about dyes and colors, the first chemical dyes, um, strong chemical dyes, we don't see until about 1850. So you can look at those shoes and know that, that probably what happened, I've seen this in other cases, but I've not seen the account for those shoes. A woman will go to a shoemaker with a fabric or textile, and then the shoemaker will affix them to the uh, the shoe, and you can you know and that, so that's going to be a custom a custom order as we would think of it today. So it'll be fit to her size. It'll, she could decide the the heel, um, and so on and so on. So she would have gone to a professional shoemaker, um, not she, with the fabric, but she would not have made them herself, and they would have been hand sewn by a, uh, a shoemaker or cord wainer. Uh, so Jamie is um, sending me some information. I was way off because the green brocade dress is in eight pieces, um, right. eight pieces, the white puffy sleeve dress, uh, six pieces. Okay. So those are some official answers. Um, how did the yellow shoes get to Colonial Williamsburg if they were originally found in Maine? And of course, at the time they would have been in Maine, that was a uh, part of Massachusetts. Massachusetts, yep, exactly. So um, the uh, story, I believe the, the and I'm actually, I'm uh, please, I'm relying on my memory mm -hmm. here, okay? But uh, my recollection is, because I went back through the auction records, was that the uh, couple who found the shoes, I don't, they may have been restoring the house or, or there were other items in the house. And so they were put up at auction mm -hmm. and Colonial Williamsburg um, uh, in their wisdom uh, purchased, purchased. Do you remember years. when that happened? Like was it I, 80s, 90s? I'm going to say, I'm going to say 90s or 2000s, but I, I honestly don't know. But if you go on to the Colonial Williamsburg collection site, um, uh, they have an excellent, excellent um, uh, account of those shoes and a number of other, uh, obviously all of their other artifacts as well. So there, um, I would definitely take a look at that for the specifics, but I think it even names the couple who sold them and everything. Wow. Um, and I've shared the link too, where folks can purchase your book, um, Fashioning the New England Family. Uh, you guys, if anyone's interested, it's a really beautiful book. Um, that is available through our museum store. So if you visit mainhistorystore.com or that link uh, that I just posted in the chat, that'll take you right to the listing. Um, or when you come to visit uh, Northern Threads in person at 489 Congress Street, um, you can pick that up at our museum store during your visit. Um, oh, I know what I was going to say. Sorry. Uh, I loved... Um, how you ended this talk, you know, the idea of if you think history is static, you know, just wait a minute, um, which is what we all say too about the weather in New England. <laughs> if you if you don't like it, wait a minute, it'll change. And how true that is uh, when we're studying the past and people are making new discoveries all the time and also asking different questions all the time. And sometimes when we look at something like those shoes and we wonder, you know, what their worth is, you know, beyond just their artistry. Uh, I know sometimes it all depends on, well, maybe that question just hasn't been asked yet. And it's one of the reasons that it is so important uh, to, to preserve and to study these pieces. So yeah. I, really, I really liked the way you, uh, you ended the presentation with those thoughts. Well, thank you. And I, I do want to say, um, when, uh, when I went to college, when I went to Colby, I had already decided to become an historian, uh, pretty much, but being in 
Waterville, being at Colby, and then some of my instructors definitely solidified that plan. Um, I was able to learn about what was then called the new social history, which even then wasn't that new, and now it's right. whatever we want to call it, but um, which was really looking at history from the bottom up, the at lives of everyday people. And on reflection, preparing for this talk, I realized that, you know, that that is really still the biggest part of what interests me about what we do. Um, and luckily, for the last, you know, 40 years or so, 50 years, 40 years, people have been starting to collect um, artifacts from everyday people. Uh, we still don't have the collections are still skewed. You're going to find, you know, more uh, of, the, of the fancy wedding shoes and wedding clothes because those are special occasions and people spent money and so on. Then you're going to find um, work shoes, which somebody would wear, you know, until they fell apart um, or if they were wool shoes, you know. So we still have a skewed uh, version, but I just want to go back to Williamsburg. Um, there was a pair of uh, vernacular, so local made, New England red wool shoes, um, possibly with a Rhode Island history, that were up at, for auction at Skinner a few years ago. And, um, and in their wisdom, Colonel Williamsburg purchased these shoes because now they are incredibly rare to find a pair right. of red broadcloth shoes that were made by a local maker. They have blue and white ticking inside. You know, the, the shoemaker put this somewhat clumsy piece of silk uh, or of uh, gold lace on the front. But to me, that says more, you know, more about what was really happening. Um, and so, so it was in fact, uh, and continues to be my time in New England that has made me even more uh, history um, convinced that I made the right decision, so. I think so too. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us uh, this evening. And um, thank you to our audience too for joining us. Uh, Kimberly, was there anything else that you wanted to say before we uh, say goodbye? No, just uh, everybody go see the show. It's awesome. That's thank you it. so much. And uh, thanks everyone. Hope we'll see you at uh, Northern Thread soon. And uh, hope we'll see you again here for another virtual program. Take care. Good night, everybody.